Hello, I'm Pam Crabtree, President of the Hopewell Valley Regional Board of Education. On April 16, 1996, voters in all three Hopewell Valley municipalities will have the opportunity to vote on the 1996 and 97 general fund budget for the Hopewell Valley Regional School District. In order to help the voters make an informed decision, the Hopewell Valley Regional School Board and Administration have put together this video. The video will highlight some of the most important features of the proposed school budget and answer some of the most commonly asked questions. In preparing this school budget, the school board and the administration have tried to balance the educational needs of our students and the financial concerns of taxpayers in the Valley. This is never an easy job. In the past three years, we have seen our school enrollment increase from 2,605 students in September 1993 to an anticipated 3,138 students in September 1996, a 20% increase in our school population. At the same time, our total per pupil expenditures have de declined by more than $500. In recent years, state aid to our district has declined dramatically. Three years ago, we received nearly half a million dollars in transition aid from the state. Two years ago, we received approximately a quarter million dollars in transition aid. Next year, our state transition aid will be reduced to only $61,000, which includes a $50,000 bonus for administrative efficiency. Our transportation aid from the state remains unchanged from last year, despite our increasing in po population. Unfortunately, this means that the local taxpayers must bear a larger share of the cost for educating our children. Last year, we received $2 million in overall state aid. This year, we will receive only $1.9 million, a 5% reduction despite a 7% increase in our student population. In order to lessen the tax impact of our budget on local Hopewell Valley taxpayers, we have taken some dramatic steps in constructing this year's budget. The most obvious is our decision to privatize our school busing, saving the taxpayers over $500,000. Later in this video, the Vice President of our School Board, Chuck Cumming, will describe in detail how the decision to privatize school transportation was made. We have made other important changes in this year's budget. Computers have transformed the American workplace in the last 10 years, and technology plays an increasingly important role in almost all jobs in America today. In order to prepare our students for jobs and for higher education, our budget includes increased spending for computers in the classroom. We have also increased the amount that we are spending on preventive maintenance so that the Hopewell Valley voters will never again be asked to pay for a maintenance referendum. Hello, I'm John Namath, Business Administrator and Board Secretary of the Hopewell Valley Regional School District. The 1996-97 school budget fiscal year runs from July 1st, 1996 through June 30th, 1997. Budget preparation begins in November. From November through March, staff, administration, the Board of Education, County Superintendent, State Department of Education, and the public review the annual spending plan. Following required public advertisements and hearings, the budget is presented for a public vote at the annual school election. This year, the annual school election is scheduled for Tuesday, April 16, 1996. The budget is comprised of two segments, general fund budget and debt service budget. Voters have previously adopted the debt service budget by passing the maintenance referendum in 1992 and the facilities referendum in 1995. Voters will now be asked to vote on the 1996-97 general fund budget tax levy amount. The local tax levy required for the total budget represents approximately 91% of the budget revenue. State aid to the district represents approximately 7% of the total budget revenue. Federal aid and miscellaneous income represent approximately 2% of the total budget. The annual school election is scheduled for Tuesday, April 16, 1996, from 2 p.m. until 9 p.m. 
Recent revisions to New Jersey school election laws have resulted in revised polling locations for this year's annual school election. The election districts are as follows. Polling District 1, Hopewell Township Municipal Building Auditorium, Washington Crossing, Pennington Road. Polling District Number 2, Union Fire Company Auditorium, Route 29, River Road, Titusville. Polling District Number 3, Timberlane Junior School Cafetorium. Polling District Number 4, Hopewell Valley Regional School District Administration Building Gymnasium, 425 South Main Street, Pennington. Polling District Number 5, Hopewell Elementary School, 35 Princeton Avenue, Hopewell. Polling District Number 6, Hopewell Township Municipal Building Auditorium, Washington Crossing, Pennington Road. Polling District Number 7, Hopewell Valley Regional School District Administration Building Gymnasium, 425 South Main Street, Pennington. Pennington Borough, Polling District Number 8, Pennington Borough Administration Building, 30 North Main Street. Polling District Number 9, Tollgate Grammar School, 275 South Main Street. Hopewell Borough, Polling District Number 10, Hopewell Borough Municipal Building, Greenwood and Columbia Avenues. As a reminder, a sample ballot will be mailed by the Mercer County Board of Elections to each registered voter in the school district. Hello, I'm Rich Gelnitz, Chair of the Board's Finance Committee. As John explained, on April 16th, you'll have the opportunity to vote on the school district budget for next year. I'll begin by explaining the fiscal policies identified by the Board that guide the administration through the development of the budget. Then I'll go on to give the financial details. There are several fiscal policies developed by the board that have shaped the school district budget over the past three years. Let me explain these policies first. First, we have no choice regarding expenditures related to increased enrollment and the expansion of facilities. However, we can limit other expenditures to those that are absolutely necessary, and we do. We're holding back on hiring additional administrative and support staff. The only increases in personnel are directly related to increased enrollment. Another priority is maintaining the existing student-teacher ratio at all grade levels. We also decided to increase the amount budgeted for building maintenance and technology used by students until these annual investments reach about 2% of the total expenditure budget. And we also seek economies by carefully examining existing expenditure patterns and by considering more cost-effective alternatives. Later in this report, you'll hear from other board members and the superintendent about specific steps the board has taken to carry out these policies. The general fund budget includes all expenditures except state and federal grants and debt service, which pays the principal and interest on bonds. It includes salaries, utilities, supplies, equipment, and so forth. As the chart shows, the district's general fund budget increased 5% this year, and the budget adopted by the Board of Education for next year increases 4.3%. These increases may seem like a lot in an economy with an inflation rate of 2 to 3%. Yes, some of, these incre some of this increase is due to inflation. However, for the most part, the increase is to provide instruction for additional students. Let's look at the enrollment figures for a moment. As you can see, our enrollment has increased steadily over the past three years. Budget increases are directly related to these enrollment increases. As you look at this next chart, you can see that while the enrollment increased by 12.6% during the past two years, the budget increase has only been 8.6% for the same two years. The budget for next year continues this pattern, a student increase of 7%, and a budget increase of 4.3 percent. Another way to look at a school district budget is to compare the per pupil expenditure. Two years ago we were spending $8,858 per student. This decreased to 8507 last year. There was a slight increase to 8552 this year, but the decline continues next year to 8334 
the decrease in, these, in this three-year period of more than $524 per student is the result of the board's fiscal policy. Board members are very aware of the impact of the budget and of the budget increases that are necessary to provide facilities and instruction for the increased enrollment. The board has made a real effort to balance concern for the tax impact for homeowners with its obligation to maintain a quality educational program for the students in our community. In addition to providing teachers and instructional materials, we must also provide facilities for the expanding enrollment. Four years ago, the community approved a $12.9 million bond issue to catch up with major maintenance needs and bring our schools to an acceptable level of repair. This school is a good example of how those funds were spent. It looks great. It has energy efficient windows, safety improvements were made, electrical and heating systems were improved. Now this building will serve the community for many years. In 1992, while the maintenance referendum had been approved, the district was spending approximately $0.5 million to pay off bonds sold to build the Bear Tavern addition. That was the district's only indebtedness. Last year, the community approved $22.5 million to place a small addition on this school and a much larger addition to three other schools. With the sale of the two newer bond issues, interest and principal payments increased this year to $2 million and will increase to $2.7 million next year. This amount will increase the following year to about $3 million and may remain at that level for the foreseeable future. The board has made every effort to mitigate the instructional and facilities costs that are a result of increased enrollment. To some extent, the expanded rateable base has helped keep taxes from increasing more. However, in the short run, we are experiencing significant tax rate increases. The school tax rate for next year are shown on this chart. You're probably aware that all three municipalities are now assessed at market value. The projected $1.34 tax rate for Hopewell Borough is a 10 cent or 7.9 percent increase. The rate in the township will increase by 8 cents or 6.7 percent. And the $1.41 tax rate in Pennington is a 2 cent or 1.4 percent increase. Each municipality has a rateable base, which is the total of the assessed value of all property within that municipality. Any change in the rateable base affects the tax rate. This year, the township had a $25 million increase in its $1.4 billion rateable base. Pennington Borough's rateable base of $2.208 million increased by $5 million as a result of the new construction of Pennington Point. Hopewell Borough is experiencing the largest tax increase because their rateable base of $156 million was reduced by $160,000 as a result of assessment appeals. The actual tax rate for property owners will vary depending on the assessed value of the property and the municipal tax rate change. For example, the projected increase for Hopewell Borough Home assessed at $200,000 is $220, $180 more in Hopewell Township and $60 more in Pennington Borough. Again, the tax increase is a function of assessment practices and municipal growth. All of the rateable growth in a municipality accrues to the benefit of that municipality the year it appears on the tax roll. In following years, all the municipalities benefit from the increase, which now shows up for the first time in the total rateables for all municipalities in a regionalized district. One final comment that will give you more information about the district's budget experience. The State Department of Education recently produced a guide to compare spending among New Jersey's public school districts. The cost per pupil for the eight K-12 districts in Mercer County are shown in comparison to the state average. This cost figure includes most, but not all, of the costs to a school district. The state has left out certain costs that would not be comparable among districts, such as state and local and federal grants and debt service expenditures. The districts in the column on the left are the four school districts in Mercer County that are spending more than the state average. Notice that Hopewell Valley, at $7,050 is about 10% below the state average and one of the lowest expenditure districts in Mercer County. Last year, the district received a $50,000 award from the state for its cost-effective budget policies. We passed that on to the taxpayers as tax relief. 
We have been notified again this year that the district will receive another $50,000, which we have also passed along as tax relief. The board is proud of the quality of education that is being offered to the young people of our community. Board members work hard to maintain a quality educational program, yet we are always mindful of that program and the cost of that program to taxpayers. We believe that we are making our cost-effective fiscal decisions. Remember to vote on April 16th. My name is David Thomas. Uh, I'm the superintendent of schools. From time to time, there are uh, several general questions that come up about the school budget process. Sarah Gregg is here to ask those questions on behalf of the community. How do you put the school district budget together? Who's involved? How do you know what's really needed? Well, the, the process of putting the school district budget together begins in November when the principals and the other budget managers start preparing their budgets. Uh, then uh, in December at that table over there, uh, the business manager and the assistant business manager uh, meet with myself and each budget manager for several hours and we approve and disapprove the expenditures. Then the uh, business manager puts them together uh, into a document and it's usually more than uh, the money that's available and uh, we then uh, continue to meet back with the other administrators to prepare a budget for presentation to the board that's within the acceptable limits of the money that we have and eventually the board then adopts that budget and presents it to the public. What priorities did you use in approving budget requests from principals and others? Well, the board's been very clear uh, about their priorities. Uh, they want to ensure that the um, quality of the instructional program that we currently have is not lost with the increasing enrollment. Um, Therefore, the priorities we have are the teachers that we need to maintain class sizes, the textbooks, the supplies, and other expenditures that are linked directly to the increased enrollment. And the boards ask us to hold back on um, non-essential expenditures, uh, administrators, uh, support services, and other expenditures that aren't linked directly to enrollment increases. Why did the board set those priorities? Well, the board's very aware that the um, majority of the money that we get, over 90%, comes from the individual taxpayer. Uh, we don't have a great deal of uh, uh, commercial or industrial base, and that during this time, when the enrollment increases are requiring us to expand each year, uh, for the teachers we need and the additional textbook and supplies, they've asked us to keep these non-essential expenditures to an absolute minimum to hold back the tax increases. What are the two exceptions to that limit that you mentioned previously? Well, the, the first exception has to do with the uh, maintenance of the school plant. Uh, previous boards did not budget the funds that were needed and as you may be aware and others, um, the budget uh, for maintenance that was developed by the community of about 12.9 million has been spent in the last three years and we hope to never have to go through that again. Uh, therefore, last year we started to budget $100,000. This year we've increased it to $200,000 and we will continue to about $100,000 a year to increase that until it gets to be about two percent of the budget and we think that will be pretty close to what's needed to replace the roofs, the boilers, the heating systems, the ventilating systems and carpeting and all those other things that are necessary to keep our buildings in good repair. What was the other exception? The, the other exception had to do with technology. When I came into the district three years ago uh, there was almost uh, no expenditure. In fact there was nothing in the budget for technology and what we had was pretty outdated uh, and so we started building and each year we've added. Currently uh, in the budget that's coming up we're spending over four hundred thousand dollars a year for technology and we've built that by trading off expenditures each year. We're going to continue to add to that until also we get to about two percent of the budget um, and we think that that should be very close to what's necessary 
to, to not only purchase the computers, the hardware, the software that we need in the classrooms, but as that becomes obsolete uh, over the short period of time that that sort of thing becomes obsolete, we'll be able to maintain uh, that level of expenditure in the classroom and maintain that kind of environment to support our instructional program. I read in the paper that safety busing is an issue again this year. Well, unfortunately, that's the case. We thought that we were rid of it last year uh, because the legislature passed a law that said that we could charge parents and that we could put that in our school budget unless the commissioner took it out. But this year, uh, he came back with the same ruling and said uh, if, it's, if it's beyond the state minimums, it's either unnecessary or it's safety, and if it's safety, it belongs to the municipality. Uh, we asked the mayors and the councils what they wanted us to do. And they said that uh, we should ask the public again for our right to put it in our budget. We think that's where it belongs. Um, so we're going to do that. It'll be on the ballot. If it fails, they pretty well promised us that they'll pay for it. it it's kind of silly because in the long run, it's going to cost the taxpayer the same, whether it's in the municipal budget or the school budget. But we're going to ask for the right to do that. And if we don't get it, we think the municipal governments will uh, provide that service as they did last year. What's happening with the new state funding proposal? As you may know, the governor has placed before the legislature a funding proposal. She's had to do that because the current uh, state funding law has been declared unconstitutional. The um, <laughs> Supreme Court has said to the legislature that the current funding does not provide fairly and adequately for the children in the state. Some children have access to adequate funds and some don't. The one way to resolve this is to have every child in the state spend the same. Uh, California uh, made that solution and, and in, for my money I'm very much in favor of the proposal which the governor has presented to the legislature which I think is in the long range interest which does not start with that assumption that every child in the state is going to receive an education of exactly the same amount. What it does is, is say that there's a certain level that can be determined that's adequate and that every child will be given an opportunity to have that level of education. What's at question now is what is that level, how much is it going to cost, and what's the legislature going to adopt. In the long run, I think establishing what's an adequate level and providing the resources to poor communities to ensure they get there and letting communities like mm -hmm. us who spend just about the average, a little less than the average, um, make our own decisions about what we want to spend. And if those districts uh, that spend more than us want to spend more, it really doesn't hurt us. It doesn't hurt the, the children in the school districts that are being provided by the state, uh, the adequate level, uh, but allows those districts to provide what they think. And, and so the future of the state of New Jersey's educational system, I think, is very much involved in what the legislature does this year with what I think is a very good proposal put forward by the uh, governor and the commissioner. The proposed budget continues to support the district's major investment in technology. We believe that technology must be a part of every student's education, not just at grade 12, but all through the child's schooling from kindergarten through 12th grade. Technology gives our students access to a vast array of resources. We want them to be technologically confident, competent, and comfortable with their skills and in their ability to use technology to gather information and to prepare and present reports. This past year, 95-96, we took the following giant steps in technology. One, we updated our existing computer equipment. Two, we opened new computer labs. One more at Bear Tavern. This gave Bear Tavern two labs, one more than the other two schools. Hopewell has one, Tollgate has one, but Bear Tavern has the highest enrollment. We opened up an additional lab at Timberlane, the middle school. 
and another two labs at Central High School. We awarded technology incentive grants. Teachers who had a good idea and wanted to do something in their classroom related to technology had an opportunity to submit proposals to a committee, a committee comprised of parents, staff, and representatives from the business community. Fifty thousand dollars was allocated for the technology grants and the teachers that received those grants have been using technology in their classroom and giving us a really good idea of how we can use it in the curriculum. We provided staff development during the year and during the summer. We purchased new software and had groups of teachers writing curriculum units. In the budget for 96-97, we intend to continue these investments. One, we will continue with our technology incentive grants. Two, we intend to implement a classroom computer initiative. This means that one grade will be selected in which every classroom on that grade will receive a set number of computers. The committee has recommended grade one. Every grade one classroom next year will receive from four to six computers. We intend to continue to provide staff development, develop new curriculum units, increase student access to the internet, purchase new equipment, CD-ROM towers for the high school, and continue to purchase software that will enhance the curriculum both within the classrooms and in the computer labs. The Hopewell Valley School District has taken tremendous strides over the last 18 months to enhance and upgrade our technologies available to our students and our staff. It is a top priority of our Board of Education and the school district family as a whole to continue this trend. Technology abounds all around us. We believe that computers and technology should not be uh, a separate entity but should really be embedded and integrated into our existing curriculum. This is our first year of our technology grant incentive program for teachers. The goal of the program is to embed computers and other technologies directly into our K-12 classrooms to spur innovative and creative ways to integrate technology into our curriculum and strengthen our instruction. Grant proposals were written by teachers and read and evaluated by a team of educators and corporate volunteers and then prioritized for funding. Teachers and students made the grants more successful than, was, than what was originally anticipated and the expected outcomes were far exceeded. The success of this program will be duplicated again for the 1996-1997 school year as we put another $50,000 towards this project. Our internet access in our five school district buildings is to be expanded for our staff and, and students in the 1996-1997 budget. A web server will be implemented at both the elementary and secondary levels providing internet access to some of our computer labs instead of just uh, single workstations. The wealth of information on the internet will bring a new dimension to the research capabilities of our students and our staff members. The Classroom Computer Initiative for the 1996-1997 school year will place six computers, a printer, and telecommunications and networking peripherals into all 12 of our first grade classrooms. This will be the start of a process where our students will begin to use technology as part of their everyday instructional program, utilizing this technology where and when it is needed, in the classroom. This program includes the hardware, software, furniture, and staff training for our, our placement of computers into the first grade. Our staff development program included a large component on technology this past year. For 1996-1997, we will continue to offer courses for our staff beginning in the summertime and all throughout the school year that will focus on the integration and utilization of computers and technology into the curriculum. We are moving beyond the introductory hardware usage courses as, as our staff becomes more familiar and more experienced with computers and focus more on the impact of technology on our curriculum and, and on our instruction. Uh, recently, the board had to face a very tough decision. We were looking at the uh, bus services that we provide for our students. And right now, about half our buses are uh, owned by the district and uh, driven by district drivers, and half are contracted. 
Uh, we have been continually asking our administration to look at ways to provide a high quality education at a very low cost or at the lowest cost possible. The administration recently came to the board with a recommendation that we study the possibility of privatizing the buses uh, with an estimate that we could save somewhere between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars a year. The board appointed an ad hoc committee to look at this and I was the chair of the committee. Two other members of the board were on the committee and we studied the, uh, the situation. We talked to a number of other districts that have contracted their uh, buses. We talked to some of the bus services that provide contracting. We held a public hearing and we had uh, uh, a number of parents come and talk to us about their perceptions. We uh, uh, gathered information and statistics on what it would cost if we contracted the routes out. The uh, bottom line was that we found that uh, although a number of parents said they had complaints about contract services, we uh, had just about as many complaints from uh, buses uh, where our own drivers were the drivers. And we looked at the overall quality that we would get from the contract uh, services. Currently, as I said, we have 50% of our buses uh, run by contract uh, uh, companies. And we had determined that uh, because of the concern of the taxpayers, the need to uh, keep our costs as low as we possibly can, while not hurting the quality of education that we provide, that we really had only one choice to make, and that was to uh, make a difficult choice, a difficult one from the standpoint of letting a, a number of very loyal uh, drivers who have worked for the district for a number of years uh, go or uh, take away their jobs. But to save the four to five hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, we've made the decision to contract out uh, our, all of our bus service for next year. Uh, we've let the uh, contractor put the bids out. Uh, we've gotten the contract uh, uh, bids back in, and we, in fact, are going to be saving upwards of five hundred thousand dollars by this decision to uh, contract our buses out. My name is Sally Turner, and I'm chairman of the Facilities Committee for the Local School Board. I want to tell you about the facilities improvements we are making with the funds provided from the community. In 1992, the community approved a referendum to pay for major improvements throughout the school district. In this school and in all the other schools, the old windows were replaced with attractive, energy-efficient windows. This school was completely renovated inside, included, including increasing the electrical service to meet its needs. We have completed almost all major maintenance projects at all the schools. The Central High School soccer field is the narrowest field in our conference and needs improved drainage. This summer, we will fill in the swale behind me outside the fence and widen and improve the soccer field and at the same time improve drainage. There is another soccer field at the far back of Timber Lane that also needs work. The work on these fields will be the last of the projects that will be accomplished with a $12.9 million referendum fund. One of the final projects at the high school is the replacement of the old wooden building that was used for storage of athletic and school equipment. As you can see, the construction has just recently started for this replacement. The science facilities in the high school have not been expanded or updated since the school was originally built. In the area where I am standing, we are constructing eight new science rooms. These rooms will pr provide a much improved instructional space for science. The old science rooms will be refurbished to provide additional classrooms. We are also building an addition at the Hopewell Elementary School to improve the core facilities and to provide more classrooms. And a small addition at Tollgate Grammar to move the cafeteria from the basement and remodel the cafeteria area into adequate music and art facilities. We are just beginning the construction phase on the four additions that will house our increased enrollment. 
Currently, we are using temporary classrooms, substandard facilities, and art and music classrooms to provide regular classroom instruction for our elementary students. The four editions are designed to be completed in time for the opening of school in the fall of 1997. The largest edition will be here at Timberlane Middle School so that all of our sixth graders will be reassigned to this building. Moving sixth grades to Timberlane and the new additions will replace the substandard classrooms and provide more room for growth. The addition to this school will be built on this parking lot where I am standing. At Bear Tavern Elementary School, we replaced all of the windows, added a bus loop for safety reasons, and made some improvements in the lighting. However, we did not do much interior work. We built an addition to this school several years ago. Its capacity is approximately 600 students, so we are making no further additions here. In the next few years, the boiler and the roof will need to be replaced and other maintenance needs should be scheduled. Maintaining the community's investment in our public schools is a continuing process. Maintenance was not adequately budgeted for in the past, which resulted in the $12.9 million maintenance referendum. Last year we budgeted $100,000 for facilities maintenance. This year's budget increases that amount to a total of $200,000. We plan to continue to increase this annual investment by about $100,000 each succeeding budget until we reach a point where the budget for facilities maintenance is about 2% of the total budget. This will be necessary to adequately maintain our school buildings and prevent any need for a future bond referendum. Each year the board reviews the five-year long-range plan for these maintenance items. I'm standing in front of the administrative office building. This 60-year-old building is being refurbished and updated to continue to house the district's central offices. Like the schools, all of the windows were replaced and the old inefficient heating and cooling systems were replaced. Renovations to the second floor were recently completed. We welcome all of you to come in and see how beautiful they are. The work on this building should be completed by this spring. The community made sound decisions when funds were approved to update and modernize and to provide additions for increased enrollment. I've shown you some of the projects that we have completed and are in the process of completing. Our buildings are in good shape and we're going to keep them that way by budgeting adequately for their maintenance. Our schools are one of this community's finest assets. The facilities represent a significant community investment and they are an important component that help us provide a quality education program for the children of this community. We plan to refurbish these old shops which serve as the district's transportation and maintenance facility. We recently decided to contract out the rest of our busing service because it will save the district more than $400,000 a year. We have delayed going, doing the work on this building until we were certain whether or not we would be continuing to service a fleet of buses. We will go ahead and do some refurbishing of this building because it will still house our transportation and maintenance offices. The work will begin in the near future. We hope that this video will answer your questions about the proposed school district budget. Please be sure to vote on April 16th. The polls are open from 2 to 9 p.m. The Board of Education and the Administration want to work together with the community to continue to make excellence in education a reality for our district.